first things first. Mm. Hello, I'm Mark Oldman, and I'm here to tell you a little bit about wine and to introduce this really incredible night. Um, I just took a tour of what you're going to see later upstairs. I expected an 8, maybe an 8.2. This is ridiculous going on. There are all these interactive booths based on Amazon Prime shows that I am completely gobsmacked by. I mean, I live in New York. I'm used to, like, the Met. I'm used to, like, interactive exhibits. I'm used to the cutting edge. I haven't felt this way, and this sounds like I'm toting to Amazon here, but since, my, since I bought Alexa, <laughs> I swear they didn't tell me to say that, but like, I'm like, this thing really works. And um, they have knocked it out of the park. So after what we're going to go over right now, um, you get to drink all six wines, and it reminds me of like, I remember in college, like one of those progressive like fraternity houses, but like with a lot of money put in. So <laughs> each room is the opportunity to drink and interact, and it's very Instagram friendly. So, all right. Now, you might know me from my books. This is my latest book, How to Drink Like a Billionaire. And um, I appear at all the big food and wine festivals. And those who don't know me just know that my modus operandi, what I specialize in, is not chemistry of wine, not geography. I want to give you easily implemented nuggets of wine wisdom. I don't want to bore you with the stuff that wine people normally bore you with. I spend long hours thinking about nuggets, little things you can implement in wine shops and in restaurants that will actually make sense because I'm a hard audience. So I teach in a way, it's like, an audience of me out there. And I want it interesting, I want it entertaining, but above all, I want it really useful. So when Amazon came to me and they said, can you pair wine with our hot Amazon Prime TV shows? I'm like, this is a really cool challenge. And it's a great pedagogical opportunity. It's a great way to teach wine so people don't feel like they're being taught. So what we're going to do is six different wines tonight. All that you're going to you're going to have the opportunity to taste these and think about what I talked about in relation to these shows. Um, and I think, without further ado, uh, let's get the ball rolling. Um, God of video, let's roll the first clip. Okay, so that's the magic book. Oh, you're, what a nice crowd. Uh, so that's the magic book for boys. Now, my original uh, uh, challenge was, all right, this is a show about kids, maybe for kids. How do I bring alcohol into this? <laughs> but actually, the show is kind of like in that Sesame Streety way, made for kids, but then also made for adults. Uh, who here has seen it? Has anyone seen it? Cool, some of you. So basically it's uh, uh, brothers, their dad, a great inventor, has died, and um, they, through fantasy and magic, they have all these adventures and learn life lessons through it. So first theme is magic. And what we're, you're going to have tonight is bubbly. And of course, uh, what do they call it from France, please? Champagne, champagne, if you're really drunk. Uh, <laughs> what do you call the Spanish stuff? Cava and Italy? Prosecco. Makes people so happy, I nickname it Prozacco. It's uplifting. It's great at the end of the day. Um, and then, um, American sparkling wine. This is the Gloria Ferrer, and it's from Carneros, which is between Napa and Sonoma. And let me tell you, nugget alert, nugget alert. So this is what you need to know. For value, 
go for a category of wine that is known to have quality, but not from a prime time region, not from the boardwalk and park place. In other words, Napa Cabernet is bid up, it's expensive, but Napa or close to Napa bubbly is a great wine opportunity. People don't generally buy American sparkling wine, so it's not as expensive, but it's very high quality. It's made in the traditional way. So uh, bubbly, magical with food, and here's, here's a great nugget alert, have it throughout a meal. Don't just confine it to birthdays and ball drops, but drink it absolutely. People don't know this. Think about it. It's pretty much just a lean white wine with bubbles. So why can't you drink it like ginger ale? You know, why can't you drink it like the Uncola and have it throughout a meal? The wine insiders, and let me tell you, my last book was based on the idea that the people at the top of wine can relax the most about it. It's those greenhorns, those youngsters who make us all feel so, so intimidated by it. So have it, order it, and guess what will come to your table? A shiny bucket. American sparkling wine like this one, you will have not paid much for it, and yet everyone's gonna look around the table and think, what are they celebrating? You know, a lot of unhappy couples, you know, the in inevitability, and there'll be serious um, um, bottle envy uh, going on. And, and yet you won't have spent a lot of money. So like this, there's magic. Also, um, the dangerous book for boys is about putting away your gadgets. It's about getting back to kind of adventure stories and going old school and having real experiences. One experience I like to have, and I do it in LA when I visit and when I'm at hotels, is I call it a PHBR, pre-hotel bubbly run. You will increase the happiness of your vacation by buying an inexpensive bottle of bubbly, one for each day of your trip, Take out the Toblerone, all that stuff. You might get charged temporarily. Put in your bubbly, and it will make any vacation much happier, much more joyful. So do that. And now, thank you for clapping, but now I have to risk my life, because this is what we do. Um, OK, so finally, the, uh, the other thing about this show, there's magic, but it's the overall theme of fantasy. And one of the things that captivates people the most about bubbly is sabering. And my lawyers have told me to tell you, don't try this at home. <laughs> but I'll teach you how to do it, just in case you want to do it. The first time I did it, I kid you not, was with uh, yellow safety glasses and kitchen mitts. Um, you never know, and guys, you know what I'm talking about. You never know when a bottle will prematurely erupt. <laughs> so always point it away from eyeballs here. So basically, I've made the bottle really, really cold. Every single bottle has a seam running up two sides of it. That's how it's made. So you can see it's very faint. There's a seam there. And what you do, you take the cage off very gently. And then I have a saber, but believe it or not, I've done this with a butter knife before. It isn't so much the size of the knife, it's the flow, it's the motion. It's not the meat, it's the motion. Sorry, Amazon people, sorry, Jeff Bezos, if, if that offended you. Okay, so what you do, you don't need a saber, but it looks cooler this way. You run it up the, okay. Let's, who said, who said I can't see? Okay, can I ask you a question? Will you call 911 when this goes awry? Okay, good. All right, so you find the seam, you make the bottle really cold and brittle, and you go like that. Oh my God, I'm nervous, and by the way, <laughs> Even so-called experts like me, it only works 70% of the time. So I am on the high, high rope. Okay, 
Uh, count me down on three. Three, two, one. Three, two, one. <sighs> okay. Thank you. Now, the funny thing about it is the most dangerous part about it, and I was teaching at the Toronto Food and Wine Festival, is not the sabering, although that's pretty dangerous. Think about it. It's the greatest hits of Don't Try This at Home, contents under pressure, alcohol, flying projectiles, glass. This is bad shit right here. Uh, but that's the most dangerous part because uh, it's there that glass kind of blows out. There's nothing in the bottle, but that hurts right there. And I thought I was so cool doing this in Toronto. I grabbed it, but the bottle's wet from being in the um, bucket. It slipped through my fingers, lacerated that tender part of the inner thumb. And the, I swear to God, if I'm, if I'm lying, may I never drink another drop of wine again, uh, the Mounties came and wrapped up my hand. I was spurting like, if you remember Dan Aykroyd in Saturday Night Live playing Julia Child, I was spurting everywhere. All right, I, I'm probably not allowed to do this, but I'm going to give this to the person who, Jenny Carr right here. Okay, be careful, don't let it slip through. Okay, let's go to the next film. Film it out. God of film. Okay. That's Electric Dreams by Philip, or based on the sci-fi writer Philip K. Dick. I don't know who Philip Dick is, but I'm supposed to say Philip K. Dick. Uh, but anyway, great sci-fi writer, no longer with us. And um, obviously, it's very kind of fus fut futuristic. And the wine we're going to pair this with, and you'll have later, is a nice Sauvignon Blanc. Um, by the way, the first was Gloria Ferrer. Um, I'll post uh, pictures on the internets and on social media. Feel free to follow me at markoldman.com, by the way. And so Sauvignon Blanc, this is the electric wine. If we have electric dreams, the reason why this is electric wine, certain wines are electric. Certain wines buzz. They put a tingle on your tongue. Um, not Chardonnay. Most Chardonnays are more rich and round. But certain wines, like a Sauvignon Blanc or Chocolat from Spain, or let's see, anyone other, anyone shout out some buzzing high acid white wines? Gewürztraminer, yes, especially the ones from Alsace. Pinot Gris, certain Pinot Grigios. By the way, Sauvignon Blanc is like Pinot Grigio, but with fangs. It's got extra fangs to it. And by the way, that gets us to another point, the kind of trippy aspect of this show, that it really is, it's 12 different episodes, and it's like retro sci-fi. Um, really engaging, but what's trippy about Sauvignon Blanc and why I say it has fangs is when you smell it, and I want you to look for this tonight, it's got this mixture of herbs. Some people, well, hey, you're Californians, I envy you. You know your herbs. <laughs> herbs, herbs are free or legal at least in this, this part of the woods, um, but freshly mown grass, mint, I get chives from the Sauvignon Blanc we're drinking tonight. And by the way, don't think I'm making that up after watching <laughs> the trippy uh, uh, film like this. No, it's, um, that's a classic pro-approved descriptor. So it's the herbal quality of Sauvignon Blanc mixed with the lemony, citric snap. It's almost like a metaphorical lemon squeeze. Like if you think about it, last night, I had um, a swordfish, and I ordered lemons to come later, and I squeezed the lemons on the swordfish. A nice, lean, white wine maybe is jarring by itself, but with food, it's perfect because it's like a turbocharger for your appetite. It heightens the flavor of your food. So that's why you should give Sauvignon Blanc a really, really um, good try even if you think you don't like it. It's light and, and refreshing. Um, I call it the sensory penetrator 
because you smell it, it makes your nostrils flare. The French, when they smell that acid herbal quality, anyone French here? All right, we can talk. <laughs> the French call it the pit, um, uh, mm, pipi du chat, uh, cat's pee, because it has that kind of piercing herbal acid quality that somehow they know, you know, uh, uh, that a soup sauna of urea in it, but in, in a good way, in a really good way. I love a good Sauvignon Blanc. Um, and so anyone know what, speaking of the future, Robert Mondavi, the guy who made fine wine fine in California, coined the term fumé blanc. And do you know what that means? It means Sauvignon Blanc. But in the 60s, the late 60s, people were afraid to drink Sauvignon Blanc because it was, it was getting really, really sweet and kind of low quality. So he wanted to, uh, being a marketing genius, he's like, I'm gonna take this French word, puy fumé, and mix it with this hard to pronounce word, Sauvignon Blanc, and create fumé blanc. So, nugget, when you see fumé blanc, and it, many producers now use that term. He forgot to trademark it. Nugget, always trademark your brilliant invention. Um, Fumé Blanc just means Sauvignon Blanc, that acid herbal lemon squeeze for your food. Next film, please. All right. So, Long Strange Trip, documentary on the dead, the Grateful Dead, a really good, um, almost four hours, um, but I am personally not a deadhead, even though I have lots of friends who are, and I found it really engaging. Um, it was very, very well done, and so I'm pairing it with, this is gnarly head Chardonnay, and um, I just thought the word gnarly with the Grateful Dead had a certain commingling there, um, but gnarly is kind of like the word bitchin', where it could be for the forces of bad or forces of good. And gnarly, with the Grateful Dead, kind of reminds me of, well, Donald Trump is talking in my pocket. I don't know, that, now, that's a, now that's gnarly. <laughs> oh my God, you can't plan this, this, this is, this is a technology malfunction. Uh, NASA Houston, uh, we, have, we have trouble. Anyway, so why is uh, Chardonnay, well, first of all, if you read the papers, and uh, more like me, if you watch TMZ, you will see that um, John Mayer made a gnarly face. He loves the dead, and he was playing the Grateful Dead, and they said he made his Grateful Dead gnarly face. So that, too, is a transference over to Chardonnay. But more than that, and an early head Char Char Chardonnay, but more than that, uh, Chardonnay had, well, let's take a little poll. Who loves it and who hates it? Wow. I'd say that's 55% hate, 45% love. And my sister hates it. I often love it but it's not fashionable to love it. Nuggets you need to know about Chardonnay. A, it's still the most popular white wine in America. B, the anything but Chardonnay crowd hates it because I think in the 90s and a little bit after, the style of it was so oaky and so rich, it hid the real fruit flavors in it. But winemakers, like you'll, when you have your gnarly head tonight, you'll see they're pulling back. So it's not as big and as rich as it used to be. It kind of lets the um, pineapple-y, lemony, uh, real fruit flavors come, come through, but it's gonna be richer than Sauvignon Blanc. And um, I think it's a lovely wine. You have to watch the use of oak. Now, the transfer over to the Grateful Dead, hugely popular band, hugely popular. Um, and why were they so, that clip actually helps explain one of the reasons why 
they were so popular, and they appealed, even though people misconstrue the dead as, you know, appealing just to flower children and like potheads and all that, you saw it was different constituencies. Who knew the deaf? And uh, they actually, camera lovers and um, amateur photographers, they had a section where other bands were like, we cannot bootleg, or, or you're, you know, uh, you're not allowed to bootleg, we will actually arrest you. Hey, listen, I saw what's happening. That just popped into my mind. Do you remember that? Rerun, and who did he try to bootleg? Oh my God, you're good. That's right. That taught us all in the late 70s, do not even try bootlegging. But the dead said, in fact, you, not only can you bootleg, we're gonna create a special section for you to come and video. And that's one thing I learned from the documentary. So like Chardonnay appeals to people who want a richer white wine, which is a lot of people. People who maybe like the perception of a little bit of sweetness, but it's actually a dry wine. Dry, nugget alert, means not sweet. Not sweet like a dessert wine. No extra sugar added or it didn't go through a process where it has a lot of extra sugar. Um, and yet, it's kind of what a lot of Americans want. <laughs> Did I just snort my Chardonnay? <laughs> it figures, you know, with a drug-using uh, dead audience. All right, on that, I've got nothing more to say. Run the video. All right. Very cool. Mozart in the jungle. So about the New York uh, classical music scene. I didn't realize there was a scene, but apparently there is one. And um, very niche, but really well done, dreamy, very well regarded. Um, and that brings us to our last, so we did a bubbly, uh, we, American sparkling wine, we did a Sauvignon Blanc, we did a Chardonnay. Now we're on where I am, my two books ago, I wrote a book called um, Old Men's Brave New World of Wine. And what I meant by that is that there are all these great wine buying opportunities um, at an affordable price. Used to be that Burgundy, Bordeaux, uh, Napa were, the, were your only options. Now there are wines from all over the world, and there are wines, as I'm sure you know because you're, you're a cool audience, um, in LA, so you know that there are all sorts of grapes used. And I want to highlight by the way, all these bottles are about 20 at a store. This bottle is about $10. This is the Pine Ridge Chenin Blanc Viognier mix. Now, that's a mouthful, and what happens is, because it's a mouthful, it's not marked up as much. Um, kind of like a niche uh, world here where there's value where you can't pronounce it. Uh, Merlot, Chardonnay, easy to pronounce, you're gonna pay a comfort premium. But Gewürztraminer or Viognier or Chenin Blanc, unfamiliar, performance anxiety, <laughs> we feel it, it's not gonna be bid up on the menu, on the wine list, and it's actually a very good value. Uh, so the intrepid wineries out there, especially the ones in California, uh, Pine Ridge is known for like $100 Cabernets, $50 to $150 bottle, but they do this out of the love for it, and it's wildly consistent. So when you go to taste it tonight, um, by the way, you're going to swirl it if you feel like it. When we swirl it, what are we doing? aerating it, exposing it to oxygen, allowing more vapors to come out. I'm gonna show you a little trick that even the pros don't always do. So if you really wanna get a better smell of it, what, do what I call, nugget alert, put a lid on it. Put a lid on it, you will double the aromas from it. So when you do, when you do that, or when you drink tonight, do that, and you'll see that 
because of this Viognier and Chenin Blanc, Viognier is known, and I bet some of you are like, yeah, you know, we've had that before, because there are certain California producers that do it. There's a tropical quality to it. And Sauvignon Blanc has more of that electric, buzzy, down power line acidity. And together, it's really nice and rich and ripe smelling, but then it's clean on the palate for a, a relatively warm day, like the weather, I'm so jealous you guys are on the good side of the tracks. LA, this damn weather, you're probably like, I, you know, I don't appreciate it. You know, it's another day in paradise. But for these tired New York asphalt seeing eyes, this is beauty right here. Yeah, I'm seeing it in LA. It's here, it's here. To, to, the, to the better side of the tracks. One day I'll, I'll live here. Um, the last point I wanted to make is, okay, we have this niche world of, of, of music, of classical music. One thing that's so amazing, and I, I interview a lot of like well-known people who are wine lovers, half of them are musicians. Um, everyone from, and they really, they not only love, and I'm not talking Vince Neil with the licensed Motley Crue wine, you know, blah, blah, blah. Although I do love a good wild side or girls, 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 you know. I, you know, I know they played at the Whiskey A Go Go, but I'm talking about Mick Fleetwood of Fleetwood Mac, Getty Lee of Rush, huge Burgundy fan. All these musicians love wine, and I think it's because both music and wine are ephemeral for the senses. You drink it or you hear it, and it, it doesn't last that long, but generally speaking, the finer music and the finer wine seems to resonate with you longer. So wine, with wine it's called finish. So what we're looking for in a great wine is a wine that won't just evaporate off your palate, but will stay with you maybe 30 seconds or 40 seconds. You'll keep tasting it. So it's longer lasting for the senses like music. On that, roll the videotape. <laughs> what show? Yeah, please. It's it's a it's a fine fine show. What show is this? <laughs> Mrs. Maisel. I was like Maisel or Maisel. It's actually Maisel. Um, two Golden Globes. This show is loved by audience members like me and also uh, TV critics. It's gotten great reviews. Upper West Side, uh, Comfortable Wife. Uh, begins the transition, that's a dangerous word these days, but begins the journey to uh, becoming a stand-up comedian f with humor that feels like the great uh, late Joan Rivers. Um, so fantastic show and um, we then pair it with, we, we've got two wines left and you'll have two red wines tonight, uh, so uh, Pinot Noir. And like this very well-regarded show, Pinot Noir, for many collectors, here's a nugget, is often the last stop. This is the last stop in our love. This, this is where, like, we often start with, let's say, uh, 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 I started with a raspberry wine cooler. They don't exist anymore. Uh, and then, like, maybe, like, a, a knocked over the head by the two-by-four Chardonnay. Uh, and, then, and then you go to maybe like, oh, you know, giant red wines. And then often the last stop, the most delicate type of red wine is your Pinot Noir. What's the movie? Sideways, thank you. Virginia Madsen talking about how something so delicate, the grapes are so fragile, they can easily bruise. And um, what you should know is not only is this so popular, especially with the connoisseurs, popular like Mrs. Maisel, but um, Mrs. Maisel, you know, it's about uh, kind of the potential of this great female comedian, um, very honest, saying things that female comedians didn't say in the 1950s. By the way, I just want to interject that interactive display for this is the most amazing thing. A, it looks like the Met where there are all these amazing period outfits of Mrs. Maisel um, from the 50s, but then also you stand in front of a mirror and it puts you in 1950s New York. And 
I can't wait to send this out on social media. Yes, I'm addicted too, just like everyone else. Uh, but anyway, um, there are certain wines, here's a nugget, that are considered masculine, for, for lack of a better word, and certain wines that are considered more feminine because they're more delicate and perfumed. Pinot Noir, and you'll see this tonight. The, this is Three Vineyards Pinot Noir. That's the name of it. Um, it's, you can see it's lighter looking, and then when you smell it, it's more about like rose petals, not to get too poetic, but kind of red fruits, raspberry rose petals. It doesn't knock you over the head. Um, this is actually, a good Pinot Noir is the kind of wine you can totally chill. And the reason why we don't chill all nugget, the reason why we don't chill all red wines is the really heavy, rich red wines, when you chill them, the tannin becomes more pronounced. The bitterness, uh, the gum numbing feel on your tongue becomes kind of more bitter. But when it's a lighter red wine, it doesn't have a lot of that tannin to uh, begin with. So it's perfectly fine to chill it for 20 minutes. It makes it more refreshing. It focuses the flavors and it kind of diminishes that sense of alcoholic heat, almost like brandy that comes off uh, wine sometimes. I was in this restaurant last night here in LA and I said to my table mates, we had a Pinot Noir from New Zealand. I said, watch this. And by the way, if you want to be a wine badass, Please follow my lead. So what you do, and again, this is absolutely approved by the top people in wine, but rejected by the greenhorns who don't really know wine. Ask for a little thing of ice. And I did. And I took my Pinot Noir, which was served at room temperature, but the problem is 70 degrees shouldn't be where you're having your, it's not refreshing, especially a lighter red wine without a lot of tannin. I got the ice, I dropped the ice in. Now for those who are afraid of, um, actually you could call it d dilution anxiety, those who feel like they're afraid of diluting their wine, you can put the ice and just circle it around for, I don't know, 30 seconds. Listen, I live on the edge, so I keep the ice in there. And you know what, I, and waiters in restaurants that know their wine are like, yeah, 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 he, he knows what he's doing. Uh, cooler, he's focusing the flavors, he's diminishing that alcoholic heat. Uh, but in, let's say, a TGI Fridays, called Fridays now, they'll be like, oh, we've got another, you know, bridge and tunnel guy from Hoboken. Uh, nothing wrong with that. I'm a Jersey guy myself, so I, I, I live through it. But cooling down a red wine like this is one of the coolest, greatest things that Mo Robert Mondavi himself thought nothing of dropping an ice cube. I, I even asked his son, Peter, what, is that true? No, because why he he was the boss. He didn't care. He just wanted to wanted it to be more refreshing. So that's Mrs. Maisel. Check out the exhibition is going to blow your mind. Let's go to the last video. Awesome. The Grand Tour. Basically a new and improved version of Top Gear. And I have to be honest with you, both until I started preparing for this, I didn't even realize it was back. And it is so good. So what do I, how do I want to transfer the wine to this show? Uh, well, and, and I will say, it's not only one of my favorite Amazon shows, it's one of my favorite shows, period. Part of it is because of the chemistry of the sardonic, crotchety guy, for those of you who don't know, is Jeremy Clarkson. And then his two cohorts, they just have amazing chemistry together. It's a great blend. And your last wine is a red blend. And people will ask me, what's the deal with blends? Are blends hiding the intrinsic grape? You're not calling it a Cabernet, you're just calling it a red blend. Are they hiding something? In good cases, no. In fact, great red Bordeaux is a blend of five grapes. Uh, many wines are blends, and I'll tell you, Nugget, I'll tell you why blends are good. A, it adds complexity. When you get bored of Jeremy Clarkson, if you do, you've got your other uh, more moderating characters. Similarly, you've got Grenache, Syrah, um, 
This is, by the way, called the Trouvé, but it sounds French. It's from California, from the Central Coast. Um, and um, it's uh, Grenache, Syrah, Merlot, Zinfandel, and all those different grapes, when done right, creates complexity, like different ingredients in a soup. It's hard to do it right, but in this case, it's really good. And also, the good thing about a blend, it spreads the agricultural risk. So if the Merlot didn't come out that well that year because of the weather conditions, maybe the Grenache did. So they can adjust it and, and create a consistently good wine. Now, unlike your Pinot Noir, which is considered more of that perfumed light style, although there are many exceptions to the rule, this is more of a red blend with darker grapes, richer, stronger grapes. So more like this kind of robust, action-packed show where you have just crazy, madcap races. By the way, you'll see upstairs, I know I'm teasing you, but literally, I didn't know. I asked to be taken around upstairs, and I'm like, I'm like a kid in a candy store. I'm like, this is, this is like a fun house, and like the Met, and like museums wish they had this sort of technology. It's cutting edge. So, but anyway, there's a bar and a great neon uh, Grand Tour red light, uh, or uh, red neon light. Um, and like the show, um, this wine, it's a little high-low. Uh, it's got um, approachability and pairability with like a steak, a good red blend. You can pair this with a fancy steak, but you could pair it with a hamburger. You can go high, you can go low, and be very safe with it, especially because it's just a $20 wine. Um, so anyway, that's what I wanted to tell you. Um, I can't wait to free you, and I'm going to do so in five seconds. So I want to thank you so much. You are the best audience, and <laughs> cheers. Have fun tonight. This is really special. We're not at Hollywood and Vine. We're at Hollywood and Wine. Yeah. Thank you.